How can you even call yourself Mr. a judge? Brooks, I need to make a record of some I need things. to make a record too. You don't. When am to... I gonna get the chance to do that? All right, I need to make a record. He's being removed to the other courtroom. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years as an award-winning mentalist to teach behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and TV shows all over the world. In this video, we are looking at one of the craziest trials I've seen in my entire career. The subject is Daryl Brooks, who was charged and convicted of 76 charges after he drove his car through a crowded parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Now, one of the interesting things about this case is that when it came time to go to trial, he decided to represent himself, despite having very little knowledge of how these proceedings work. So the trial has been, in short, a massive circus. You can pretty much go to any point in this trial and you're gonna see a bunch of arguments and tension and the judge having to explain to him how things work. And we're gonna look at a lot of these behaviors from both a behavioral and legal standpoint. For the legal perspective, I've brought in a guest who is no stranger to the channel and someone who has a really keen eye for the details of these cases. But I do wanna say this, we've split this video into two parts. So one part is right here, you're watching it, but I will leave a link in the description where you can go check out the rest of this analysis on his channel. And there's a lot of great stuff in both, so I really do encourage you, when you're done with this video, there's no real order, part one, part two, it doesn't really matter. When you're done with this, you can go check out the other half on his channel. Today's guest is someone that regular viewers of the channel are very familiar with. He is one of my favorite lawyers on YouTube and he was very helpful during the famous Amber Heard versus Johnny Depp trial because he was actually in that courtroom, but in his practice, he specializes in family law and litigation. So I'll come back to the channel, Rob Morton from Law & Lumber. Hey, Spotty, how you doing? How you doing, man? This is exciting. I'm so excited to tackle this with you because there, from both the legal angle and the behavioral angle, there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. And this particular case took me not by surprise. I knew there were going to be fireworks. I didn't know we were going to get to this level, but it wasn't until about week two or three that I really started to draw my attention. And that was when I contacted you and I was saying, this is something we have to take a look at. And here we are. Here we are. So let's dive right in, starting with the first clip. I would like an update on whether uh, Mr. Brooks filled out a subpoena for Don Woods and provided that to the state. Has that been done? No, we haven't received anything, Your Honor, and obviously she can appear here voluntarily. Our position would be, Your Honor, that we will not be responsible in any fashion for producing Miss Woods. Mr. Brooks talks to her on a daily basis. If he wants her here, he can produce her on Monday. Yeah, they ain't got to worry about that. So I just wanted to know, because I know subpoena form was filled out. If, so I, if I, I want her to be here, she's going to be here. I agree with so the just, state just that, know that. Uh, she could certainly appear. It ain't even got to be no arrangement. All I got to say is come. She don't come. <laughs> that simple. Mr. Brooks, do you intend to call her as a witness? Because I'm directing yeah, you to said, have her here we said at all 9 that, We said all that at the beginning, man. Like, I don't even want to be in here that much longer. Just do what you got to do so I can get up out of here. I'm tired of being in the courtroom that has no integrity whatsoever. How can you even call yourself Mr. a judge? Brooks, I need to make a record of some I need things. to make a record, too. You don't when am to I going to get the chance to do that? All right, I need to make a record. He's being removed to the other courtroom. Okay, so that was just an example of an early clip of a confrontational moment with him and the judge. And we saw this kind of thing a lot. And it's one of the reasons this trial gained a lot of popularity in the media because he kept getting confrontational with the judge, with the state, and this just kept happening. So Rob, I want you to talk about what we're seeing here, this kind of attitude, this kind of lashing out. How often in your career have you seen this kind of thing? How often have you seen someone in a case like this represent themselves. It's important to note, he's made that decision to represent himself. So how often in a case of this magnitude have you seen someone represent themselves and how often have you seen this kind of attitude? Rob, go. Oh, um, never. Never on both counts. I've seen some crazy things in court, but I don't think I've ever seen something like I saw with this particular trial. Now, when you sent me this clip, I didn't know how many takes it would take us to go through this but I figured it had to be at least more than one because I thought I would be throwing something against the wall once I heard him go into his outrage towards the court. 
as an attorney, you don't have the ability or the right to show this level of disrespect to the tribunal. You must be respectful. You must abide by rules of decorum and standard that have to take place in that courtroom. He disregarded that at every single turn. What's notable is in this particular case, in this instance here that we're watching, he's talking about a subpoena for his mother to testify on his behalf. Now, the state in the case up to this point has been gracious enough to donate their time, and I do mean gracious, to sign and execute those subpoenas, to issue them, to get his witnesses there to court for him. That is not something that an opposing counsel will do in any particular case. In this instance, he says, I don't need you to do that. If it's my mom, if she's going to be here, she's going to be here. If I ask her to be here, she'll be here. Well, spoiler alert, she didn't show. Now, there was something in this that I flagged immediately for your input. One, when he pulls the mask down, I don't think I've seen a more textbook look of contempt, and I wanted to get your input on that. And two, he moves the book around and does some paper shuffling that threw me off. I didn't really know how to read that. So I wanted to get your take on both of those. Awesome. And I'm so glad that you talked about those two moments because they're both in my notes. So um, a few things for me from a behavioral standpoint. First of all, right here, it says on my notes, ego, ego, ego. So a lot of what we're going to see, not just in that moment, but moving forward is him understanding that he's in a position where he doesn't have that much power, but his ego doesn't allow him to deal with that. So every chance he gets to assert power, to exercise power, he's gonna take that chance. And this is a great demonstration of that because the conversation keeps flowing, the judge keeps talking, and he just keeps going back to, you don't even have to worry about that. If I want her here, she's gonna be here. It, nothing to talk about. And he just keeps going back to that because he wants people to understand that this is something that I have control over. You may have control over other things here, but that's one thing that I have control over. It's the same with the books. This is my table. No one's messing around with this space. I do what I want here. I can put my book here. I can move my files here if I want them here. It's the same later in the case. At some point, he started building a fort with boxes. Oh, God. It's, it's the same thing. It's like, this is my things. And... I have control here. And we often see this in children, by the way, children who feel like they don't have a lot of decision-making abilities, but when they do have a decision to make, they really take it seriously and they make sure that you know that this is their responsibility. It's the same with him. He's taking every opportunity he can to assert that I can make this decision right here. If, she, if I want her to be here, she's gonna be here. When the mask comes off, I'm so happy you caught that. I'm so happy you said the word contempt. So Paul Ekman, did all the research on the universal emotions, the, the emotions that all humans experience and display the same way. And one of them is contempt. And throughout this case, very often when he's on tilt, when he's upset, as he's talking or yelling, we see one corner of that lip as he's talking go like exactly, like, like this as he's talking. Now, some people who have had facial paralysis, Bell's palsy, who suffered a stroke, you'll see that when they talk, one side of their mouth moves more. But that's not what this is because it doesn't happen all the time. It happens when he's getting, when that tension is going up. And we start to see that one, just that upper corner. It's not the one side of the mouth moving more. It's that one corner going like this a lot. And that's just contempt. It's almost part of his baseline when he gets aggravated. And this is a man who's quite contemptuous. Now, I noticed that when he did the contempt part, when the lip came up, a lot of things happened with his chin at the same time. He pulled the lip up and he immediately got more confrontational with his shoulders and chin and shoved it out, like, yeah. like just snarling. Right, so it's not just the shoulders and the chin, it's also the bottom lip. I want you to pay attention to when he says, I need to make a record too. And as we're seeing that upper lip here, he goes two, and you see this really exaggerated two, like this. You know what I'm talking about? He and sticks this, it out. Like yeah. he sticks it out. You know, two, like this. When you see someone talk to you and you see that, not just the chin lunging at you, but that bottom lip as they talk mm, like this, it's about to get physical. This is something we look for in pre-aggression. And this is something where if, if there wasn't a table, if he wasn't in a courtroom, this would likely get quite physical because it's very aggressive. And usually if you see that in the real world, Try to de-escalate, try to calm down the situation because it's about to get really hot. I do want to throw in one more thing. While the judge is talking, we see a very clear and pronounced shrug. As his shoulders come up like this, his hands are out in front of him like this, and his eyebrows are up. And the best research on shrugging, and I talk about this a lot on the channel, was conducted in France by Camille Debras. 
And she really went in and microanalyzed shrugs and found all the different reasons we shrug. And the bottom line is when we shrug, it's because we're lacking something. There's something we don't have, whether it's, I don't care, I don't know. And in this case, I don't have any power here. I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. And we saw, we see this shrugging a lot when he's feeling like he's out of options. He doesn't know what to do. And this was a great example of it. And I think the reason it's happening, it's called an attitudinal uh, shrug. And it's basically an attitude of, I don't have power here. I, I can't do anything. I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at a loss of options. So that's the shrug we're seeing. Would that make sense, Rob, given the context? Yeah, almost like an exasperation, like a, uh, like a, a, a sense of immediate frustration. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, now we're gonna keep going and look at some other moments that give us really great insight as to what his intentions might be during this trial. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that like button, it really does help get this video out there. Hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology. And second of all, if we go down that road, we would be forced to counter that claim by pointing out that not only does the defendant not live with the child in question, he doesn't live with any of the other children that he has, he impregnated Erica Patterson when she was a minor in Nevada, and for doing so, he was convicted of stab. <laughs> pled guilty in March of 2007 to that felony offense and is a <laughs> on the registry as a result. So, if there's any causation that would lead to Erica Patterson being a bad mom, Mr. Brooks has a direct role in that causation. And that's the object to that. I'm not Because sure. that's a lie. Let him finish. Because at the end of the day, Let if, him we, finish. if we don't open the Mr. door on that, no, since he want to make a record and not be accurate, so let's be ac accurate all on the record since you think you know so much. Once so again, we can Mr. open Brooks the door on, we can loud, open the door on how old she told me she was when we met. We can ask he's, that question he is to me. Over the top animated right now. Do you know that? Mr. Brooks, I'm ordering you to sit down and to let the state no, finish. No, I'm not going to sit here and let somebody be inaccurate on the record and lie right. on the record. Right. Under Illinois versus Allen, I've warned him repeatedly. He's being removed from the courtroom. Um, and you know what? Let me dial that back. We're just going to take an early lunch. Um, so let's let's kind of start off with what's going on here. And uh, Spidey, I know that you had a question in particular when it came to this particular clip after watching that. And what was that question? Yeah, so the question is this, uh, in terms of body language and behavior, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff in the first clip, and I talked a lot about that. On this one, I kind of wanted you to walk us through this, because there's a lot more legal stuff here than uh, behavioral. And so for, he keeps doing this throughout the entire trial, for the record. Your Honor, I want this on the record, the record. He just keeps going back to the record. So Rob, the question I have is, what is this record that is so important to him and why is it this important to him? Oh, the magical record, the record, the record, the record, the record. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the record in any trial court proceeding, the record is what is transcribed by the court reporter. The record is what is taking place in the courtroom. And before the days of audiovisual capabilities, we had court reporters that would write down everything. You always saw the old movies. They said, let the record reflect that the person identified the person at the table. It's because someone pointed in a direction and you actually have to type down what's being seen in that courtroom. So the record is this thing that is the compilation of all of the pleadings, the filings, the things that are said in court. That is the record itself. Now, to Mr. Brooks, the record is something different. To Mr. Brooks, the record is the hired adjudicatory body of magic. He just wants the record to be his version of the truth. So when people start talking and it, he doesn't agree with what they're saying, he wants the, quote, record to reflect that his version of the truth is different than this other person's version of the truth. That is not the freaking record. The record is what is being transcribed in court. Now, what the prosecutor does in this case is great. He lays out what's called an offer of proof. It says, if Mr. Brooks wants to continue cross-examining his ex-girlfriend and trying to impugn her credibility with photographs that suggest that she, in Mr. Brooks's mind, might not be the best of mothers, then the prosecutor is going to be forced to bring up a number of things in his past that he doesn't want brought up. Namely, that she, I believe, was the age of 14 when they first got became intimate, was convicted of statutory uh statutory engagement with a minor and the prosecutor is ticking these things off and watch the confidence just boom 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 that's a power move that is a prosecutor who's well in his element and knows exactly what he's saying and is basically saying you want to dig your grave i will go ahead and let you jump in it there's also there's this confrontation i was curious about because he keeps saying like 
That's inaccurate on record. If you want to be inaccurate on record, you want to lie on record. That's a lie. That's a lie. But from what I understood, the uh, prosecuting attorney was just listing things that are facts, like things that legally are on the record. Um, so when he says like, that's inaccurate, that's a lie. What's a lie? What, what, what from what the guy said is a lie? Well, that's the thing. There are certain things that are taken as a matter of course. There's a certain things that the court has the ability to take what's called judicial notice of. The court has the ability to take judicial notice of someone's criminal background because it has already been adjudicated. There is no running away from that. It's not something you have to reprove. It's already a part of history. It is fact. Then there's stuff that takes place in court. This is stuff that is a subject matter of dispute. Things that people are testifying to to try and prove the factual or inaccurate representation of what's being testified to. Those are things that are subject to controversy. Now, what Mr. Brooks is trying to do is he's trying to basically play a game of there's evidence that I don't like. So I'm going to say it's factually inaccurate for the record. Always for the record. His objection has been noted repeatedly. The judge tells him, tells him the objection has been noted. Please stop interrupting the proceedings. Mr. Brooks does not abide and continues to interrupt the proceedings unendlessly. That's, that's the point I was trying to make. And you, and you explained it so eloquently to where when he's saying that's a lie, you know, and that's inaccurate on the record, but it's not. He's just listing things that were already in the court of law proven that you pled guilty to. I can't say this Tomorrow. for the record. One that I intend, one witness I intend to call tomorrow is not going to be 35 minutes. Fair enough. Do you plan, plan to call that person in the morning or the afternoon? I'm, I'm leaning towards the afternoon. That could change depending on the flow of the morning, I would guess. If you just want to tell helps. me who it is so we can prepare so that person is told to come in the afternoon rather than wait through the morning? I don't want to say who it is. Well, I want the person to be here when we're ready to go, but... They were here today, if that helps. Yeah, I know who it is. It's Erica Patterson, Your Honor. There's maybe. no mystery here. Maybe right. it is, That's maybe what it I isn't. Would have, that's kind of who I thought it would be as well. I, so... Uh, I'm going to have her come tomorrow afternoon. Then. Okay, we'll have, have her here at 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So Thank we need you. to be mindful of people's <clears throat> schedules. Thank you. Thanks. We'll have so, everyone else here. At that's eight interesting thirty. because what if that was not who I was referring to? Then you need to tell me right now so I can make an alteration to that. Come on, Judge. I'm calling a snuggle break. Okay, so before I lose my mind on this clip, I'm going to ask you what it was that we saw on his face and why he seemed so excited when the judge asked him who his next witness would be and he seemed like he was playing a game. What was going on? One word, leverage. He's in a situation where he doesn't have a lot of power. He's the least informed person. You know that we have a bunch of very competent prosecutors. We have a very competent judge. He's often the one who can't keep up. So anytime he feels like he has a bit of control over something, we see excitement and we see him really exerting that control and really dragging it out to say like, no, I, I have a say here. This is exciting for him because this is something that he knows. He has this leverage that he knows. He has a secret information that they don't know. And he's excited about this. Like, ooh, for once, I'm the one who, who knows something that the two of you don't know. So it's, he's excited over this leverage that he has over the judge. He's got her right where he wants her to where she's asking him like, okay, well, so who is this witness? Like he wants, she wants something from him. They want something from him. And he's just excited about that because for once he's got the leverage. But even as someone who's not a lawyer, I was extremely frustrated by him making light of this. Like, can we remember why you're here? Can we remember why you're, this isn't like, Ah, oh, at the end there, the, the prosecutor said, well, it's, it's no big surprise. We know who it is. And the judge said, yeah, I, I kind of figured that's who it is as well. Are they, now, I get that he's frustrating and his behavior is frustrating and, and they've been more than patient with him up until this point. But are they technically allowed to do that? Like move forward with an assumption that to them is clear, but he hasn't actually confirmed? Yeah. I mean, both, both sides are strategizing. They don't have to divulge every single element of their case. They can call witnesses out of order. They can call witnesses 
that are surprise witnesses, they have to get them in with some evidentiary basis and some reason for not disclosing them previously. But for the most part, we kind of know the list of witnesses as a whole, and we start to understand how they might want to call them. Now, the part that frustrated me about this clip was when Spidey was telling you about the excitement that he had for the fact that he had control and he was saying, look, I'm a big boy and I can, I can handle myself in this situation. I had this sinking feeling when I was watching this in real time that I might know or think who this witness was. And that was confirmed with the prosecutor's response. This is the ex-girlfriend that he's calling to the stand. So he's excited that he has this leverage over the prosecutor in something that he's divulging. But there's a part of that excitement that at least in my practice, domestic relations litigation is founded in something that was very disturbing to see. And he's calling his ex-girlfriend to the stand and he Can I guess what it is? Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. I just want to see if, yeah. if we're on the same wavelength here. Is it his excitement that he gets to like, so obviously he had a quite abusive relationship with her and he kind of gets to in plain sight continue that for lack of better terms dominance over her and and she has to sit there and take it is it that you're 100 percent accurate and that's why there i'm very glad that there was like no monitor within arm's range when i was watching this because that was really frustrating to see he wants to put his ex-girlfriend on the stand not because he wants to elicit testimony from her that's going to be helpful to his case but because he wants to berate her and ask her questions that are wholly irrelevant to the case at bar and it's a power dynamic. And I've talked about this briefly in previous videos on my channel. If you want to check them out, you can. There's an element of that examination that is remarkably disturbing to watch where she's testifying and he exerts this long pause to regain control in the conversation. And there's so much manipulation that takes place. And watching this, this one clip that's the precursor, the preamble to this is remarkably disturbing because you can see there's an excitement. There's a power. He's excited by the power he's about to have. Yep. I think that's exactly what it is. I think he's excited at the power he has in many situations. I have knowledge that the judge doesn't have. I have knowledge that the prosecutor doesn't have. I have the power to bring my ex-girlfriend in and ask her all these questions she has to answer. And he's power tripping. We're seeing the joy of someone who, who with a big ego, power tripping. Yep, and it's hard to watch. We are now about to watch testimony from Adam Bonesteel, who was a witness at the event. He saw what happened. And I want to start by playing some of this video without the audio. I will leave a link in the description to where you can go watch the whole thing, his whole testimony. But right now, because he's saying things that are really sensitive, he's describing graphically things that happened, I want you to see the body language, but just here in the beginning right now, he's describing what he saw, in detail at the event and we'll pick it up when the audio kicks in and, and the uh, lawyers ask him some questions. So this happened th that close to you? Yes. You saw all this with your own two eyes? Yes. Did the car continue past you? Yes. Where did it go? The car veered kind of in front of me. I saw brake lights. At that point, that was my only focus I, my vehicle, I threw it in park and ran to decipher if this was really who I think it is. Let's show you an item that's been marked as exhibit uh, 46, please. And we're gonna put it up for you first and have you take a look at it. So, is it up on your screen, sir? Yep. In this frame, I don't see you in this frame yet, correct? That's correct. But we do see Jane laying there on the road, correct? That's correct. She's got the red top and the black plaid pants. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. We're going to go ahead and play it all the way through 15 seconds at normal speed. This is one of the most impactful witnesses I've seen during this trial. And I didn't think of that at first glance. So when we're talking about behavioral analytics or anything about testimony, et cetera, there are certain things that are things that get broken down by people like Spidey. That's why he's my friend. That's why I like to talk to him about this stuff because I want to hear his input. 
but it's because something triggers in me where something on my gut level is telling me there's something I should see that there's some reason why I feel the way I do about the testimony I'm hearing. And I want to know why. So that's why I asked Spidey. And this guy is a perfect example for that. You have a gut feeling when you're hearing him talk and you know, without spoiling the punchline, Spidey, why did I have that gut feeling? Yes, Rob, I completely agree. There are a lot of instances with what I do where you just feel something is happening. And this is one of those cases. You don't have to know body language to look at this guy and say, something's going on and look at him and, and, and feel for him. And a lot going on. First of all, one of the main important things I wanna talk about is recall. So there's something called eye accessing cues that there's a lot of misinformation about out there. You know, I've often heard people in my videos say something like, oh, that person looked up into the left as they were telling that story, so that's not real, but up into the right is real recall. First of all, there's never one sign of anything that allows you to know someone's being deceptive, nothing. So even if that were true, it would have to be within a cluster. Second, although there are certain patterns that you might see a little more often, you really can't generalize that way. Every person has a different habit when it comes to recall. Some people close their eyes, some people might look to the side, but there are certain generalizations. And one of them is when we get deeply emotional, we look down. So with this gentleman, that is very much the case. As he's remembering what happened and he's telling the story, his eyes are going down because he's recalling, but he's also getting quite emotional. When we get emotional, we close into ourselves and that's what's happening. But later on, when he's being asked questions later in his testimony, and they're more factual questions, more direct questions, we see him go up as he thinks of the answers. So does that mean, oh my God, he's being deceptive because one is real recall, one isn't? No, it's just that one is more emotional recall and you could see that emotion on him, whereas the other one, he's just simply, he's talking about the day, the weather on that day, and we see his eyes go up as he's just trying to recall the date. It's less emotional. Second, and Rob, I'm sure you picked up on this. After he's done telling his story, when the uh, state lawyer asks questions, he's very quick to answer. Yes, 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 direct. Almost before she finishes, just yes, yes. He's very clear on this. This is really honest behavior. There's no fluff. There's no um, hesitation, amending, just yes. That's what happened. There's, there's absolutely no question here. There are witnesses that testify and they say yes, 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 yes. And it sounds dismissive. It doesn't sound like they're actually convincing. You feel it in their body language when they say yes, 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 yes. And then there's witnesses that testify with conviction and they give you the assertive yes, yes, yes. There's a conviction that comes forward. You can tell the difference between the two. You might not know why, but you can. Yeah. I think it's a difference between dismissive, like, I don't want to be here, and dismissive, like, I can't talk about this. Mm -hmm. Like, I was there. I know what happened. And, like, we need to get through this right now. There's a sense of urgency here of, like, him being very clear on what happened and just needing to get through this. Next, another great example of why clusters are very, very important. Because when he's looking at that screen, and, Rob, I saw you react to this, um, we see a lip compression followed by face touching and mouth blocking. And exactly. And often within a cluster, we say that this indicates high stress and you want to ask more questions. Like if other things are happening, that might indicate deception. But in this case, it's isolated. He's looking at that screen and we're just seeing that. And I'll tell you exactly what that is. The reason this mouth blocking, face touching, lip compression goes into a cluster of deception is because it usually indicates something we're holding back, something we're not saying. So can that be deceptive? Like we're holding information back? It can, but it can also mean we're holding back emotion. And in this case, he just wants to curse. He wants to let it out. There's a rage in him that has to come out. So I think that that compression mouth blocking is him just holding himself back from letting that courtroom know what he thinks of Mr. Brooks. And here's what I want to tell you about that one point. This is very important for litigators because what you're analyzing here is exactly right. If I'm a litigator, if I'm the prosecutor and I see him doing that compression and cover his mouth while he's looking at that video, I want him to deeply feel what he's feeling because the next question I'm going to ask him is going to get him to that point. I need him to go down that path of accessing that emotion and I need it for the next question. 
If I'm on the other side, I need to cut that off. The second I see the compression, I see the mouth hide. I ask him a question before he gets into that video. I need to interrupt that mental process because if I allow him to watch the video all the way through and then ask him a question, I've allowed him to get to that emotional state that's going to be more impactful to the jury. And I need to prevent that from happening. So as litigators and as attorneys, we're watching this happen, play out, and we're trying to choose which questions and when to ask them. Rob, the other thing uh, I know you noticed is the breathing shifted. It went from belly breathing to chest breathing. And we saw that tense, heavier breathing up here. But the biggest reaction was for me right at the end. Right at the end. Um, anyone has ever seen a National Geographic photograph a lion that's about to prowl or pounce? If you ever look at the face, look at the face, look at the snout of the lion that's about to pounce on its prey, you see 100% revealed teeth, everything purses back, increases form all along here. That is just attack mode. 100%. I don't think of a better way of describing it. And when you watch this clip again, I want you to look at his face at the end of that testimony and tell me that's not a lion who wants to rip something apart. That's exactly, exactly what that is. And uh, again, going back to universal uh, emotions, anger, it, in anger, the jaw clenches. Now, it's rare in humans that with anger, we see that upper lip go like this. That's more consistent with disgust because with disgust, you're trying to close your nose because you don't want to smell it or it's grossing you out. So the nose crinkles and there's tightness on the side, it's exactly as you described, like a lion, like this. And we're seeing that tension as he's dead staring. That is extreme anger. All right, Mr. Brooks, do you have any questions for this witness? I do. Whew. I apologize, I just needed a quick second. At some point in uh, your testimony, you stated that you heard, or rather you saw brake lights. Would that be fair to say? Yes, I did. To the best of your knowledge, what would be the only time you would see brake lights on a vehicle? Uh, the point right before Jane fell off the hood. I think you misunderstood my question. If if you were driving a vehicle, the, uh, would it be fair to say that the only time anyone would see brake lights would be if you hit the brake? If the driver hit the brakes, the brake lights would go on on the vehicle. So it would be fair to say that the only way that you would see brake lights would be if the driver of the vehicle hit the brakes. That would be correct. You did testify to uh, when you were describing what you saw, you referred to the driver as he. Any reason why you would refer to the driver as he if you did not see the driver of the vehicle? That would be like the proverbial we. Is it fair to say that you could have just answered as we instead of he? Objection. Grounds? Sustained. Next question, sir. Do you recall if it was uh, still daytime or nighttime? At the well, the parade, the parade started around 4, 4.30, so... It, it gets and it was cloudy, so it was dusk. I mean, city lights were on. Um, emergency vehicles when they were pulling up. <sighs> Did he just say, Would it be fair to say you could have used we? Mm -hmm. Did he just say that? Like, like mm -hmm. the gentleman was supposed to say, We was driving the car and we ran through a crowd of people. What do you mean? You, would it be fair to say you could have used we? No, he couldn't have used we, he could have used he, she, or they. And he just chose to use he. So I'm going to come back to that in a sec. I just have something I have to say here because this was one of the points for me that made it really obvious. I think 
Daryl Brooks thinks in his head that he's in some sort of courtroom drama, TV show, or movie. Because of the way he phrases certain things. Because look at the way he asks that. He goes, uh, you said that you saw the brake lights go off, right? And the guy goes, yeah. Now, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, but the next question as a lawyer that you could have asked was say, so it is your testimony that whoever was driving the car hit the brakes. And the person would go, yes. Correct. That's, That's the, right the way to say it. it. Yeah. Exactly. So he doesn't do that. He goes, what's the wording he uses? What would be the only time you would see brake lights go off on a car? Because he wants that that in the movie, the music comes in like, oh, 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 oh he's, he's got him there. Like he's putting, oh my God, that big realization, that big twist. Like, because the guy now is supposed to say, when you hit the brakes, dun, dun, dun. So he hit the brakes. Like, He's trying to set up in this dramatic way. It doesn't even work because the guy doesn't even understand his question. So then he has to rephrase it. It becomes a giant mess. But Rob, this is the big question I have for you. With the second line of questioning here, which pronoun did you use? You know, why did you say he? What's the point of this line of questioning? Is there any doubt in this courtroom that he was the one driving that car? He tried to do this at various stages of the trial. And this kind of goes to your point of wanting or thinking he is in a courtroom drama. Realistically, there is no doubt in any juror's mind, in any person's mind that has watched any minute of this trial that he was the person behind the wheel of that car. But he views this like it's his, you know, pick your crime show. This is his moment. You're saying you didn't see that it was a man or a woman at that point in time while you were dodging out of the way of a vehicle that was coming at you? That must not have been me then. That's what he does with every question. He thinks that they, every single thing is a silver bullet. So he says, you know, wouldn't it be fair to say that you can't say it was we driving the car? Well, no, no, it's not we driving the car. It's you. But he didn't <laughs> physically see you driving the car at that moment. But that's not your be all end all. That's not your silver bullet. The jury has just heard a witness saying they saw you behind the wheel of the car. You're not doing anything to help yourself. You're just playing lawyer. And the worst part about it is he gets worse throughout the trial. The judge starts reading comments or reading analysis and says, says the word estoppel at some point in time. Well, 45 minutes later, you hear the word come out of Daryl Brooks's mouth in completely inaccurate context. He talks about subject matter jurisdiction like he knows what it actually means. It doesn't mean anything like what he's saying. To, bo to, to borrow a quote from one of my favorite lines in all of movie history, you keep saying that word. I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> that is Daryl Brooks to a T. Um, let's talk about that pause in the beginning, because I know we both have problems with that pause in the beginning to where it's now his turn to question uh, Mr. Bone Steel, And we have this slow... And he just, I'm, I'm sorry, just one second here. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're about to look at his uh, opening statements. We know what he looks like when there are certain emotions on his face. We're not seeing any of that in this moment. When he's getting ready to question Mr. Bonesteel, and he's like, I, I'm sorry, I just need a moment. And he whispers to himself, get it together. You want to take that one? It's bad theater. Um... I, I, I've talked to you about this before, and I'm going to say it again. There's a concept of what's called stolen valor, where someone who has actually partaken and engaged in military service has the right to wear the uniform. And then someone who doesn't have that right, who has not actually served in military service, wears the uniform to get the benefits derived from someone who has already engaged in that service. It's called stolen valor. I call this one stolen sympathy or stolen empathy. Someone who is not engaging or has not engaged in that behavior is trying to steal the sympathy that this witness just gained. Mr. Bone Steel has just testified openly and elicited something that Daryl Brooks saw as an emotional response from the jury. Because I guarantee you he didn't do this without seeing that there was a jury reacting to a certain in a certain way to Mr. Bone Steel's testimony. So what he does is he tries to take the sympathy that Mr. Bone Steel has given to himself by testifying truthfully and he tries to steal it to get some aimed at his table. And I don't think he did a very effective job at it, but that at least was what I took as his effort. Dude. It's so crazy how you'll often say things like, 
oh, you know, I'm no behavior expert. I'm no body language expert. And then you'll say something like that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, shut up. That was like <laughs> one of the most brilliant things ever. And you're 100% right. Okay, Rob, we have one more thing to look at here. And this is something that happened uh, after the opening statements. And I'm throwing it in as a bonus because it's just fascinating. So there was a post on Reddit where a user um, claimed to be one of the jurors and claimed that there was a lot of unfair behavior towards Daryl Brooks and that the judge was being unfair and that the trial wasn't fair. Uh, and that was the just the thread. So in the courtroom, the judge talked about that and said, there's this thing happening. I'm turning it over to the authorities to look into it, but I will not be the judge who will be looking into that. And then this happens. Making sure you use Go ahead. first. <laughs> what is this? All I can tell you, sir, is that there is apparently on the internet, on a site, or maybe it's an application, I'm not entirely sure, called Reddit. There's a subreddit um, that is entitled Justice for Daryl, and it was on that subreddit that someone wrote an anonymous post claiming to be a, one of the jurors. Just briefly skimming through it. I, I do want to stay for the record that I have no involvement with this. I'm fairly, really like shocked like this even came to light. Um, I will say, just by skimming through it, these are definitely things that have been talked about in the court. So we have to, I mean, common sense would say that this came from someone that has either been in the court to hear what goes on in the court or a, a jury member. This is no other way. Well, actually, because the, the proceedings are live streamed worldwide, Your Honor, or available on YouTube worldwide. So I don't agree with that assessment. Well... I mean, it's pretty obvious that this would come from somebody who's actually, I think it's pretty clear. So Rob, I'm going to ask you and I'm going to ask the viewers to let us know in the comments, based on your instinct, based on your gut and what he's doing there and the way he's reacting to that, do you think, and Rob, you're going to go first and, there, and you can all let us know, the viewers in the comments, do you think that he had any prior knowledge or involvement in this Reddit. Basically, two options. One is he had no involvement and no idea what this Reddit was, no clue, this is the first time he's hearing about it. And two, I don't know the depth of it, whether it's involvement or knowledge of this Reddit thread. So, did he know about it or did he not know about it? Rob. I'm gonna answer that question by asking two of my own. <clears throat> first question, he makes the comment about having just briefly skimmed this or by just briefly skimming this. Anyone who's seen that is it is a Reddit page that is a full page long in about 11 point font. For him to say just briefly skimming this in the time that you're watching that clip, you tell me that he hasn't actually read that thing before. Second comment, why did he ask immediately or go right to the point of, for the record, I have nothing to do with this. The judge did not levy a uh, accusation. The state did not levy an accusation. The Judge was trying to make a record of what was made known to the judge. For the record. For, yeah, for the record. For the, oh, for the, record. The, the, the magical record. Um, but instead, his mind goes straight to somehow this is going to come back to me. Why? That is something that's not a normal reaction to something like this. I've seen a lot of attorneys get, quote, caught off guard in court when you give them a document they have previously seen. A lot of us have remarkably practice expressions of surprise. Your Honor, I am seeing this for the first time. Give me a moment to review this document. Briefly scan, look up. I know what it is. No, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is very much in line with someone who knew what they were going to say and immediately was defensive about what was being brought to their attention. Um, I don't have any concrete opinions on this one, although I think some of the people watching this might have an idea of where I'm swaying. Listen, I'm uh, I'm usually very much in the gray area, you know, I, because I'm aware of how nuanced behavior is. And 
as a habit, I am in that gray area because I can't tell you for a fact. But if for a moment you'll allow me to put my behavioral analyst role aside for just one second, so like this isn't a, a, my professional analysis, this is me just saying, Spidey, there's something about this that's just so off. Like forget, I'm gonna tell you right now, behaviorally what's off, but forget all that. Just something about the vibe here is so off. Okay, now let's put the behavioral analysis thing back on. So <laughs> first of all, there, so many statements are meant to signal, the intent of the statements are to say, I don't know what this is. He starts by saying, your honor, what is this? When she just explained what it is. So first, what is this? Then twice he says, again, from the brief, you know, from the from just the brief glancing over this, whatever word he uses, but twice he says, you know, this was just, I've, I've only had this brief experience with it. Three, he keeps looking at it. Like as he's talking, like, he keeps looking at it to signal, in my opinion, to signal like, no, no, I need to look at this because I don't know what it is. So I'm just going to keep looking at it because I don't, I don't, Your Honor, I don't know. I don't know what this is. I have to keep looking at it. Then he makes the statement that whoever wrote this must be in this room because there's just no other way. There's no other way anybody can know what's going on in this courtroom with all the cameras. I would argue that people watching from home know even more than the jurors know because people from home see things that the jury doesn't. When he says that, you know, obvious, and he uses obviously again, obviously there's somebody who must have been in the room, what's the reasoning on that? No, just can't, you know this is being broadcast, and the other lawyer even says it, like, no, this is being broadcast all over the world. So I think what's happening there is, um, I think he had some knowledge of this, at the very least some knowledge of this. Now I do want to say this, I'm not one for conspiracy theories at all. I, I, I apply Occam's razor. Usually I find that the most likely explanation is the correct one. So I don't know how he would have gotten this information because all his communications are, Rob, they're screened or they're, you know, his phone calls, someone's listening in or they're, they're listened to or his letters are screened. Okay, so I don't know how this would have happened, how he would have been made aware of this. So I'm not saying he, he, did, he thought of this or he had someone do this. But something, he, I'm not seeing genuine surprise and I'm seeing a genuine effort here to really sell the fact that he, like you said, I had nothing to do with this. And this is, oh, this is the first time I'm seeing this. I'm just, there's something about it I'm not buying. That's it. But I'd love to hear from everyone in the comments. What do you think? Did you buy that? Do you feel like that's real surprise? Because you might, you might look at it and go, no, no, I, I absolutely believe that he'd never seen that document. I don't know. I'd love to hear from everyone in the comments. All right, there it was. I mean, this is a crazy case where you can go to any moment in this and it's just gonna be amazing stuff to look at behaviorally, legally. Uh, and Rob, I wanna thank you enormously for your time here and your value, as always, such valuable input, both in the legal sense and your understanding of human behavior always amazes me. So I wanna thank you so much for being here, Rob. It was an absolute blast. Well, and Spidey, let me, let me just echo that right back. Like uh, having, having you both as a friend and a resource that I get to talk to on a regular basis when stuff like this pops up during the week and I get to text you and, and have that back and forth dialogue of, am I crazy here or am I right in what I'm seeing? Um, and then to be able to take that content in something that's digestible, digestible in multiple formats and, and to multiple audiences is something that's really fun. So thank you very much for giving me that chance. Of course, man. It's, it's a highlight of my week when you text me and you're just, panicking and I and I'm there with you like sometimes it's like oh my god did you see opening statement oh my god yes and like we're like ah I'm like just <laughs> ah. so yeah dude always always a pleasure and I look forward to the next one yep until then okay there it was before we go to really really quick announcements first keep in mind that the other part of this analysis is on Rob's channel I will leave a link in the description but I'm not sure if it's up yet right now this second because sometimes I upload a little faster than him or maybe he did it before me not sure but if it's not there yet it'll be there very soon link is in the description second this Sunday I will be doing a Halloween live stream it's gonna be a lot of fun we're gonna be looking at clips of people who claim they have supernatural abilities or that they've experienced supernatural things it's gonna be laid back, it's gonna be fun. You guys are gonna be able to help me with the live chat and I'm going to bring in my experience not only with behavioral analysis but also as a mentalist to try to see if what we're seeing here are 
real testimonies or if someone's just trying to pull a fast one on their audiences. I hope to see you there. It's going to be this Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern right here on the channel, the Halloween live stream. I hope you will all be there. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this video, what you think of Daryl Brooks, and I'm really curious to know what you guys think of that last bit with that Reddit thread. I just find that so fascinating. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this, and I will see you on the next one.